Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning. <laughs> uh, so this morning, our service is going to be a little bit different. Uh, instead of listening to me drone away during a message, uh, we're going to break it up with some reading and some reflections uh, because we're talking about love and the Song of Songs this morning. Uh, so if you're sitting there wondering when the message is coming because the service is getting really long, it's not. It's all for me. <laughs> Um, and during conversation time, I hope that you will share a story of love with us. I think everyone here should have something that fits in that category. So I'm sure this will be a time where everybody goes around and shares a conversation this morning. Um, and that doesn't have to be romantic love or your partner. It could be your family or your pets or your love for creation or a time you felt loved by God. Any kind of love that we'll um, hear as we explore the different types of love this morning. Um, just a couple announcements. We have um, worship next Sunday at Rockwood at 10 a.m. Uh, and then we have book club coming up um, on the Wednesday, July 19th. And that's uh, to talk about denial, um, which is a fascinating book. I started it and finished it yesterday. So <laughs> it should be uh, an, an interesting discussion because it's a book that really draws you in. So if you're thinking, oh, maybe I should try out book club, this would be a good one to do it on, especially because book club comes with the potluck dinner. So <laughs> why not try it out? Um, and then that same week on July 21st at 6 p.m., there's another chance to get fed as we have faith, food, friendship, and fun on Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, so that's a chance to come together, enjoy a good meal, um, to join in some time of worship, and to do the crafts that everybody loves best out of what we do that night. So uh, it's a good chance to just get together and, and worship in a smaller group and to get to know each other. Uh, Trinity United Church in Acton is having a garage sale on July 15th. And in your announcements, it will say it's from 9 to 1 p.m., but that was a typo on their part. So it starts at 8 a.m. If you like to get up nice and early, uh, check out the Trinity Garage Sale. I know they would be really grateful to have your support. Are there any other announcements this morning? I have one, Lisa. Um, some of you will know or remember um, Leela Pirrett. She's Leela Kingston, I believe, and she passed away last night. My daughter called me this morning and wanted the church family to know. Leela's been on the prayer list for many years. She's, I think, 100 plus. Um, and she's been in a nursing home in Arthur, uh, always bright, and uh, always knew Diane. And uh, that's her daughter, Diane. So. Anyway, she said the uh, obituary will be in Guelph today and the Wellington Advertiser this week. And uh, so she just wanted everyone to know that we know it's passed. Thanks for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. Any other news to share? Um, things weighing heavy on your heart or good news you want to share with us this week? I saw Tammy had lots of good pictures on Facebook. She must have some good news to share. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> well, I had a wonderful trip to Waterton with my parents and Heidi last week. It's not super exciting to anybody else, but <laughs> <laughs> I love, love, love Waterton, Albert at a Prince of Wales hotel and the Glacier National Park there was gorgeous. So it was wonderful. Everyone else is glad they don't have Facebook, so I can put them on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Any other good news this morning? I am very pleased to uh, say that uh, my daughter has had uh, uh, several uh, uh, international students coming and staying here for uh, um, a couple of weeks. So that is to me, quite exciting because I'm using three languages again. So that uh, sounds like a lot of fun, Ross. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, certainly interesting to see if my mind is still working. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need, I need a date with Elsa. Chris has just come back from England after three weeks, so 
I don't think we've ever been apart that long since we got married, so it's been quite nice to come back. Thank you, Mrs. Nice to have him back. So, uh, in case you can hear that on Zoom, Roz was just saying that Chris was away for three weeks in England, and she's glad to have him back. Um, we are glad that mom got back safely from her trip and then her and dad went to Niagara Falls for the weekend because I guess dad thought it'd be funny to make me do all the things this morning. <laughs> Light our candle for the good news we've shared, the good news in our hearts, and the good news that wherever we go, God is with us. Now let's pause and prepare our hearts with our gathering music. Join in our call to worship. You're invited to read the words written in bold as you feel comfortable. From the whirlwind of the week, we come to find rest. From all that feels unknown and uncertain, we come to remember what matters. We come to worship from generation to generation. To find our place among the ancestors, choosing to know more about God's love. Let us pray. Ever-present God, you call us here together this morning, walking different paths to know you deeper. We give thanks for this time where our paths intersect and we can share in your love together. Be with us now as we share in scripture, song, word, and silence as we worship you together. Amen. Our opening hymn comes from Voices United 603, In Loving Partnership We Come.
all make mistakes, let's take a moment to leave those worries with God as we join in our prayer of confession. Holy mystery, who is holy love, our scripture shows us that even Jesus struggled with the balance between care of self and care for others. Guide us so that whatever choices we make are the most loving action towards creation, each other, and ourselves. Gracious God, hear our sound of prayers as we confess those things that separate us from you and from each other. Friends, hear the good news. Whatever you've done to let God down or hurt another, you are forgiven and you are loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. So this morning we're going to um, be joining in readings and reflections. Uh, if you have a bulletin, you can read the part printed in yellow. If you get distracted and forget, I have all the copies here and I'll just start <laughs> reading it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm only saying that because that's something I would do. I don't know if you noticed, but I always have to think really hard when I'm doing the hymns because I start singing away and then I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to be advancing the slides. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we get drawn into worship and we kind of lose where we are, which is a beautiful thing, but uh, can create some awkward silence. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for the people who are going to read and you can um, follow along and do that as the time comes. Um, the reason why I thought we should do this this morning instead of a traditional service is that our scripture comes from the Song of Songs, and it's not something that we get to spend a lot of time with. So I thought we want would uh, I wanted to find a way to help us go a little bit deeper into it. There's a lot of debate about um, what the Song of Songs is. Even when they were putting it into Jewish canon and then Christian canon, there was discussion of whether this secular love poem should be a part of our scripture. At the time uh, when they were discussing the Jewish canon, they decided it was probably a love story between God and Israel, so it was okay to put in. And then the Christians were like, yeah, that, that's a good thing, we'll steal that idea. <laughs> so we decided it was a love story between Jesus and the church. And those are beautiful interpretations of the scripture, and it's a, a great way to think of it. Um, and one of the gifts of poetry is that you can think of it however um, it speaks to you, and the place of the hearer as, is as important as the place of the writer for interpretation of poetry, um, but it is also a love poem. It's a um, fairly explicit at points love poem um, about two people who um, are engaged in a romantic relationship, and so it's important to remember that that is also a piece of the story and to think about why it was even put forward to be in the canon to begin with. And I think it's to remind us that God works through all the love in our lives, not just our traditional we love God because God loves us, a God they kind of love, but in those every um, ways that we connect with another person through love, God is there with us. Now in English, we have the word love that for some of us is probably a pretty weighty thing to throw around because we just have the one word and we put so much focus on it being romantic love that uh, it feels a bit awkward to say I love my friend or I love my, we can usually use it with family comfortably, but uh, if to say I love my boss would probably be uh, something you wouldn't likely do. <laughs> um, but the cool thing about Greek is that they had so many more words for love. There was um, seven different ways of describing love in a positive way. Um, that all meant deep and profound love, but it had more context. So we're gonna go through the context of those words this morning with some reading and reflections to explore how God, looked, God flows through all the love in our lives. So to prepare ourselves for this time of reflection, let's join in saying <coughs> more voices number 79, Spirit Open My Heart. <laughs>
So our first uh, type of love we're going to talk about is eros, or erotic or sexual love. Um, and that's the scripture that I think, the type of love that most directly ties with our scripture from Song of Songs. Uh, no matter how many times I preach on this passage, I'm never going to be comfortable talking about sex in church. So if, <laughs> if you're a little uncomfortable, just know that I am too. <laughs> um, but I think it's really important to talk about um, sex and romantic love, uh, because if we don't talk about it, we internalize feelings um, and we feel shame about things that there is no reason to feel shame about. Um, so not talking about sex makes us uncomfortable with our bodies and questioning what's normal and what's not normal and it means that we don't know when something is not normal and we should be going to talk to a doctor about it so having those conversations with a few close friends or family members or your partner is really really important and i think one of the um worst consequences about this culture of shame that we've built around sex and not talking openly and positively about it is that it makes people who have been sexually assaulted have trouble speaking out. If you don't have a safe space to talk about sex in a positive and healthy way and to, to share your um, feelings and encounters with others, it takes so much more courage and it already takes a lot of courage to speak out when something negative happens. Even when you have that safe space, the unbidden bidden feelings of guilt and shame, um, partly that are caused by our, our culture and our society, that people feel after being assaulted means that so much sexual assault goes unreported. Uh, I was looking up the numbers and the statistics are uh, quite broad. They said somewhere between 65 and 95% uh, of sexual assaults is unreported. I would guess it's a lot closer to the 95% than the 65. Um, and sharing in our scripture in the Song of Songs reminds us of the importance of safe space around sex and that sex is supposed to be a beautiful gift from God and something that we can celebrate. Uh, so we need to create safe space so that we can have these conversations. And creating safe space is about finding the right time and the right people to have the conversations with. For some of you, that may mean that the conversation be stays between you and your romantic partner or partners. For other people, you may want to include friends or family in that conversation. And many of you will have had to guide young people through conversations of healthy boundaries about, around sex and safe relationships as you're caring for your children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews. Uh, so it's, it's really important that we can have these conversations, even if they make us a little bit uncomfortable, um, so that the next generation can have a little bit easier time um, going forward. So as we listen to the words of our scripture this morning, I would invite you to reflect on how you have healthy conversations about erotic love and sex in a safe and loving way. Our scripture comes from Song of Songs, uh, chapter two, verses eight to 13. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping onto the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks to me and says to me, arise my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. I spend a lot of time debating what order um, to put these in, so if you think that I put them in the wrong order after, I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> and also, I don't speak Greek, so don't uh, <laughs> criticize me too harshly, especially on this pronunciation. Um, but philophia is the love of self. We live in a world where self-care has become an industry. Everyone wants to sell you the best relaxation technique or the right retreat to find yourself. We're told that the right scent or the right soap or the right song will make all our worries go away and make us feel like our whole selves. 
While there's nothing wrong with relaxing in a hot bath or picking up a good book so you can have some time to yourself, truly loving yourself requires deeper work. Love of the self means taking time to reflect and understand who you truly are. That can be done on your own, talking to a companion, or even finding your voice in a room full of people. Each one of us is unique and fearfully and wonderfully made by God, our creator. Love of the self is about having the courage to share that gift with the people around you. As we listen to the words of the poem Unmasking, I invite you to reflect on how you connect with your true self. They called you shy. They called you different. They called you awkward. They called you weird. They called you unlovable. So you put on your masks one layer at a time. A mask of false confidence, a mask of uniform interests, a mask of mindless chatter, a mask of normalcy, a mask of protection. Layers and layers of masks until you didn't recognize yourself. Habits that aren't yours, but habits that define you anyway. So you chip away at the masks, making cracks to let your light shine through. But it is hard work. Breaking free is exhausting. And you find yourself wondering if you are strong enough to break free on your own. But you don't have to do it all. You just have to let people love you. Let your guard down enough to let their love shine through and to help widen the cracks until finally you can break free to be who you truly are and know that you are loved just for being you. Our next type of love is storge, which is familial love. And at its best, a family is our people who love you for you, who have journeyed with you through all the ups and downs of life and are there to support you through it all. You share culture and history with your family. You have your own patterns of social expectations and ways of maintaining relationships. Some families spend a lot of time together, others only connect at holidays, family reunions. Storge is defined as a natural or instinctual affection between people. Having this bond with your biological family is a blessing. But for some, that is a challenge because who they are isn't accepted by their family culture or because they don't have any close family still living. For some people, this will mean forming a chosen family, a group of people who you have that instinctual love with without any biological connection. Our next scripture describes two people with that strong bond. Jonathan was in line to be king, but in part due to his deep connection with David, he was willing to give that all up for a man who was a natural leader. We don't know the exact nature of the relationship between Jonathan and David. We know that it was pretty complicated and that uh, they definitely um, had some pretty strong feelings for each other. Our scripture tells us that they had a deep and strong bond. As you listen to the scripture from 1 Samuel 18, 1 to 4, I invite you to reflect on the people in your life that you share that deep bond with. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. A relationship that is almost as close or sometimes more close than family is philia, that deep friendship that you feel um, with others. Friendship is so important in our lives. Friends are the people who open us up to perspectives beyond our family experience. Friends create safe space to explore who we are. Deep and loving friendships encourage self-expression, 
while still challenging beliefs or patterns of behavior that may uh, not be the best. Some people have friendships that last a lifetime and others uh, grow together um, for a short period of time and those friendships are just as meaningful and just as important. A loving friendship is one that shapes you for the better and even if time, distance, or life circumstances get in the way, that friend remains always in your heart. As we listen to the poem, My True Friend by Embola T. Alibi, I invite you to reflect on the friendships that shaped your heart. You always answer when I call and help me if I should fall, but you never complain at all, my true friend. You confront me when I am wrong, but will never scold me for long. Instead, you try to keep me strong, my true friend. You know the funny things to say, to make me laugh my fears away. Like the sun, you brighten my day, my true friend. You see in me the gifts I deny and urge me to give things a try. You spread for me my wings to fly, my true friend. You always perceive what I need and offer it before I plead. Just like a book, my mind, you read, my true friend. You value little things I do, but won't brag of what you do too. How can I ever repay you, my true friend? And greatest of all, I have found when things are tough and I'm down, you are the one who sticks around, my true friend. Our next type of love is Lutos, uh, which is flirtatious and playful. Lutos is that initial stage of love, that playfulness and flirtiness, the butterflies in the stomach, testing out each other's potential interests. Sometimes it grows into something more, and sometimes you just move on to other relationships. One of the challenges in flirting is that it's cultural and contextual. Not everyone uses the same patterns or ways of interaction. That is part of the playfulness, testing out if the other person feels the same way and is interpreting things the same way you do. Something like a kiss on a cheek could be a, a commonplace in one culture or context and a very intimate act in another. Our story this morning involves a kiss that could have been considered cultural if Jacob had introduced himself to Rachel first, but given the urgency of the kiss and his desire to marry Rachel even though she was not the eldest sister, makes me suspect that maybe there was something more to it. As you listen to the story of Jacob's first meeting with Rachel from Genesis 29, 1 to 11, reflect on what flirtatious, playful love means to you. Verse uh, 20, uh, or chapter 29. Then Jacob set out on his journey and went to the land of the people of the east. He looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, Three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it, because they watered their flocks from that well. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep. Then they would put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. Jacob said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. So he said to them, Do you know Laban? the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said to them, Is it well with him? And they said, It is well. And here is his daughter Rachel coming with the sheep. Then he said, Look, it is still high day. It is not time for the livestock to be gathered. Water the sheep and go past, sorry, water the sheep and go pasture them. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered, and they roll the stone from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. When Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of his mother's brother Laban, and the sheep of his mother's brother Laban, Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well, 
and watered the flock of his mother's brother Laban. Then Jacob kissed Rachel, and raised his voice, and wept. Pragma is that long-lasting love. It's a love that uh, stands the test of time, and it's about commitment and putting down roots together. <clears throat> the most common type of pragma occurs when romantic love grows into creating a family and building a life together. But this love is not limited to romantic partners. Sometimes fr friendships develop into long-standing love as you journey through life together. Pragma is a love that you share with someone who you, is your go-to person, who you know will always be there for you. When you lose that love, it leaves a hole of grief in your heart that feels like it can never be filled. But over time, when the pain subsides into manageable ebbs and flows, you will realize that that person has never really left you and will always hold a piece of your heart. As you listen to For Grief by John O'Donohue, I invite you to reflect on the person or people you have committed to share your life with and how they will always be with you. When you lose someone you love, your life becomes strange. The ground beneath you gets fragile. Your thoughts make your eyes unsure. And some dead echo drags your voice down. Where words have no confidence, where your heart has grown heavy with loss. And though this loss has wounded others too, no one knows what has been taken from you. When the silence of absence deepens, Flickers of guilt rekindle kindle regret for all that was left unsaid or undone. There are days when you wake up happy, again inside the fullness of life, until the moment breaks and you are thrown back onto the black tide of loss. Days when you have your heart back, you are unable to function well until the middle of wor work or encounter Suddenly, with no warning, you are ambushed by grief. It becomes hard to trust yourself. All you can depend on now is that sorrow will remain faithful to itself. More than you, it knows the way and will find the right time to pull and pull the rope of grief <clears throat> until, it has coiled, until that coiled hill of tears has reduced to its last drop. Gradually, you will learn acquaintance with the invisible form of your departed. And when the work of grief is done, the wound of loss will heal, and you will, all, and you will have learned to wean your eyes from that gap in the air and be able to enter the hearth in your soul where your loved one has awaited your return all the time. Our last uh, form of love that I want to talk about this morning is agape, which is universal love, love for everyone. It's the way that God loves us, without judgment and without expectation. God calls us into connection with all things through love, through agape. Loving all people doesn't mean that you're going to get along with everyone all the time, or that you have to treat everyone exactly the same. It's about meeting people where they're at, and recognizing that they are a beloved child of God. Agape means recognizing that we are all connected and that our actions and inactions impact the world around us. It is an invitation to look to God through Jesus to guide us into loving action. Reflect on where God is calling you into loving action as we pray for all of God's people. God of creation, there is so much wisdom for us in the interwoven com complexities of your creation. Through creation, we are all connected, and yet at times people still feel alone. When grieving the loss of a loved one, when facing discrimination because they are perceived as different, or when trying to find a way to be true to themselves within the limitations of our social structures. Be with all those who feel lost in the dance of creation and help them to find the steps to feel connected again. The changing of the seasons reminds us that there are times in life to grow and flourish and times to rest and restore. But at times, our personal rhythms seem out of sync with the expectations of the world. For all those who are struggling with 
managing, or trying to care for someone with physical or mental illness, we ask that you be with them in the struggle to offer healing and hope. We pray especially for people still experiencing darkness as we move through this season of light. May they be guided by your spirit into a sustainable rhythm of life. Your creation is constantly changing and evolving, and so many people feel stuck in their lives. We pray for people who are unemployed or underemployed, people who are struggling with relationships, and people who are struggling to choose the right next step along life's journey. Help them to let go of what is holding them back and to find a new path forward. Our life is sustained through the gift of water. And although water can be a source of cleansing and nourishment, it can also be a source of destruction. All around the world, people are living within political structures that were meant to help people and instead are raging like a storming seas and bubbling under the surface like a body of water waiting to flood. Help us to find ways. Help us to find ways to work together to still those waters so that everyone may have a chance to flourish. Your creation is filled with so much beauty and diversity and yet we all find pieces, different pieces that we're drawn to. Each one of us here today holds in our hearts our own joys and sorrows. We offer prayers to you now, O oh God, as we share them aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Compassionate God, we lift up our prayers to you, spoken and unspoken, and ask that you answer in your love. We ask that we, we ask this as we pray the word that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And there is not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So we've come to a time of sharing stories. Um, and I always think that it's good to model vulnerability, so I thought I would go first, um, and you can think about uh, what you'd like to share. We'll just um, do popcorn style so no one feels pressure to feel like they have to talk, but uh, really encourage you to, to share, and if you don't feel comfortable sharing in the large group, maybe find someone to, to share your story with after worship. Uh, so I thought I would tell you my story of falling in love with this little guy. He's not so little, he's actually pretty big, but um, I never liked animals growing up because I was a pretty anxious kid. I know it's probably shocking, um, but I was always afraid that I was going to do the wrong thing and I was either going to hurt them or they were going to hurt me. So I mostly just kind of stayed away from my grandpa had a few dogs and I kept my distance. I never offered to walk or feed them. And um, luckily I grew up in a house that didn't have pets in the house, so that wasn't an issue. Um, Mom always thought that was too complicated, so the best we got were a few fish that uh, ended up eating each other, so they didn't last <laughs> <laughs> So that um, made me not that interested in pets for quite some time. Um, and when I was um, in high school and we went to art lessons, I decided I was probably right about my dislike for animals because our art teacher had little kittens that when you were trying to paint would come up and scratch you. <laughs> You're just sitting there not even looking at them. Um, and so I was like, yeah, you know, having animals be just outside, probably a good choice. Um, and then I was at a friend's house and her brother was showing me these kittens and I kind of had a crush on him so I wanted to look good. <laughs> so I just uh, pretended that I was fine with them and they were the sweetest little babies and they just made me fall in love with, with cats um, and were kind of the first step of being more comfortable around animals. And then uh, quite a while later when I was living with my grandparents on the farm there would occasionally be stray cats that came around and we would feed them to get them to stay so that they would eat our mice. 
and uh, there was this one cat, Scruffy, who looked like he definitely had been through a few fights. We think maybe his tail got frozen off in the winter and he, he had a, a torn ear and he just looked so sad that I just uh, wanted to take care of the little guy. And um, so I fed him and kind of um, worked on getting close to him, but he was pretty feral because of all of the things he'd been through. And, um, by the time we were starting to get close, uh, he disappeared and he was quite old, so probably um, just found somewhere to pass on quietly, um, as cats do. And so kind of didn't think about that until my sister got some cats and she realized that I was really uncomfortable and started to show me how to interact with them in a way that uh, she kind of pointed out that cats are pretty tough and they're way more likely to hurt me than I am to hurt them. So that helped me to relax a little and. And having that um, close bond with my sister helped me to open up a little bit more. And then another few years later, I found this little guy at a friend's farm and fell in love with him because he is the most gorgeous cat. I worked really hard to just pick one picture instead of, I <laughs> may have about a hundred. <laughs> um, so he um, was pretty shy when I was first visiting him. He'd stay a long way away. and. Um, I put out a few treats and get him to come a little closer every time and it took a good couple months for him to come up and to be close to me and um, and for me to be comfortable being close to him and now when I go there he runs up when he hears the van and he comes to get treats and he wants to be cuddled constantly. <laughs> if I try to go and interact with any of the other animals I get a look that tells me that I'm here to see him. <laughs> Um, and when dad goes without me, he gets in big trouble because he doesn't get his treats. So um, it reminded me that um, to be open to, um, to connection and to be confident in trusting my instincts and to um, just, you know, share some love with this little guy. And he's grown a lot too because he used to hate my camera. He would. Uh, run away every time I got it out and it was a little tricky to get pictures of him close up and now you can see he was, I set the camera in the grass and he started playing with the straps so I thought that'd be a fun moment to snap a picture of him. Uh, so it definitely um, has made a big difference in my life to have that little guy who whenever I'm stressed I can just go and I know that he's going to be there and, and want love and affection for me and I just, yeah, he's cute and I love him. Uh, so. I'm hoping that you all have some stories to share with us. Um, they can be a lot deeper and more serious than what I shared, and they can be more fun and playful, whatever you feel like opening yourself up to sharing this morning. I'll go next. Um, last summer, we were in Waterton, because I love that place. We were visiting Emma. And uh, it's up in the mountains, and there's these beautiful lakes. And I was determined, like, I am Canadian. I am swimming in a mountain lake. I know it's going to be cold. I'm OK with that. So I'm, you know, wading in. And Mike dips his toes in. He's like, heck no, I'm out of <laughs> So I'm wading in very slowly because it's really cold. And there's fish. And I hate swimming with fish. I want them to respect my space, but they don't. So they were swimming around my feet, and they were like, Fish, like not little fish, fish. And so I look at Mike, and I'm sure everybody thought I was crazy because I was like, there's fish. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm like, oh, this is a game changer. Like, I don't know if I can do this. And so he came over and he looked and he saw that they were fish. And he's like, all right. And he jumps in the freezing cold water to scare away the fish so that I can go for my swim. And a reminder that, you know, he's not all flowers and romance. And then jumps in icy cold water to scare away the fish for me. That is also love to have. I don't know what kind of love this is, um, not, not quite sure, but but um, um, certainly I love my husband a lot, <laughs> but, but yeah, I get that out of the way, but, but when my first son was born and I held him for that first time, I thought that's a kind of love I've never felt before, and, um, and, and as much as you know, going through raising kids and grandkids, and there's some good times and bad times. Um, that deep, deep, deep love um, that I think you know that we we probably all have for our children or grandchildren 
is just something really special that I, it kind of surprised me because I didn't think there was a different kind of love, but there it was. Being lucky enough to live beside our children and grandchildren, our son and grandchildren, and having the kids, the grandkids a couple days a week, I've been trying to sort out in my mind how different is my, or is it different, my love for my grandchildren compared to our children, and whether we were just a lot busier or focused on in a different way with our kids. I, I find it's, uh, um, I, I think it is different, and, and uh, both obviously are very, uh, very special. But, uh, yeah, the, holding them in those hugs, oh, I, can't, I can't reiterate enough how, how, uh, how special that uh, connection and bond and, and love is. From watching my mom with my nephews, I can tell you that one of the biggest differences is the grandkids get a lot less lectures. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometimes I have to have a sleepover at my mom's when my brother and his wife are away. And so I, I tuck mom into bed, and up come her arms for a big hug. And I, to me, that's so special. Well, I, I was very fortunate to be part of a very great love story of my parents. And, um, life is yeah, inexplicable, really. But they had a song that was theirs, and they would sing it together. They would dance through it. Mom would play the piano, and they sang harmony. Mm -hmm. And I'll try and sing a little bit of it for you, if I can. <laughs> Maybe you've heard this before. I'll give it a try. <laughs> With someone like you, a pal good and true, I'd like to leave it all behind and go and find some place that's known to God alone, just a spot to call our own. We'll find perfect peace where joys never cease. Out there beneath the starry skies, we'll build a sweet little nest somewhere in the west and let the rest of the world go by i hope that uh, you think about the, the people and places and, and parts of creation that are important in your life and uh and find people to share those stories with um, I was never a thought that you think it's good to share and then it's going to make you cry. Um, I was at um, dinner with my cousin uh, the other day after taking him to the dentist. Um, I can tell a funny story just to get myself emotionally prepared for this. Uh, he's 14 and he's a, a little bit of a scatterbrain, uh, but we love him for that. And I took him to the dentist and he's always had a really hard time keeping his teeth clean. And he had to get electric toothbrushes and his mom is constantly hounding him to make sure he's brushing his teeth properly. And he told me that at 14, he learned that you're supposed to brush the inside of your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I know that he has very loving parents and family who've been trying to teach him how to do things, so I'm not sure how he missed that one. <laughs> but it was definitely a, a really... Uh, entertaining moment that uh, just made him love me love him all the more because he was just so clueless and I've been <laughs> watching him be clueless since he was a one-year-old baby who was running around our grandparents house causing havoc um, but he 
um, lost his father when, about five years ago. And it was, uh, we don't talk about my uncle a lot be in front of the kids because it, we know how hard that is for them to not have him there because he was just the light of our family. And um, just the other day when we were at dinner, he started talking about his dad and it was so um, wonderful to hear him be in a place in his grief where he was comfortable sharing those stories. And it also was a real gift to get to remember my uncle with him and to share some things with him that uh, that he didn't know. And sometimes we forget how important it is to share those stories with each other. Um, so I encourage you to to talk to your kids or your friends or your family and, and remember those good times together because those memories are so important. And if we don't share them, um, we don't get to relove the jo love and joy um, that come in those stories. So thank you for taking the time to share. And I hope this is a conversation that you'll carry through the week. Um, I've been thinking all through the service about how to go to get a hymn book in a way that wasn't awkward. And then I remembered that I was telling everyone you should accept yourself, and I'm just kind of awkward. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, this hymn is one that we've never sung before, so if anybody else wants a book, I can pass it around if you want the music. <laughs> So now we'll really test my multitasking skills as I try to read from a hymn book and advance the slides. <laughs> for love is with God. Go out into the world and share that love with one another. Share stories and time together and commitment to your love of God through connection with one another. Go now in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ this day and always. Amen. Amen.